I know that we're all, at times we all ask questions about healing, the mystery of healing. There's a debate, does God still heal today? We ask the question, does God heal everyone? We ask the question, is it wrong to take advantage of doctors and medicine, the medical field? Are there different types of healing? These are just a few of the questions that we all struggle with. But understand that this mystery about healing is not new. In Mark chapter one, you remember Jesus had just finished the Sermon on the Mount and he's coming down the hill and a leper throws himself at the feet of Jesus. And it says in verse 40, on one occasion, a leper came and threw himself down in front of Jesus, pleading for his healing, saying, you have the power to heal me right now if only you really want to. This mystifying aspect of divine healing continues to challenge our understanding and stir deep emotions within us. Does God really want to heal me? Does God still heal today? In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and they were scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now I want you to notice that he healed, he had compassion, and he said, I want you boys to pray to the Lord of the harvest because there's much work to be done. So I can tell you emphatically that it is God's will to heal. That's a part of his harvest. That's a part of the end time harvest. God wants to heal people. Let's title this the mystery of healing. Father, bless the reading of your word. I pray that you speak to all of us and I pray for the anointing that makes the difference. I pray for that healing gift to be in operation in this service today. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. There are five keys to this mystery that I'd like to give you, but I can't give you all five today. I'm just gonna touch on three of them and perhaps we'll see about sharing the other two at another time. But let me help you to understand who God is. You know, it's so important that we understand him. When you study scriptures, you know that you have to keep it within context, you have to be consistent, and it has to be in alignment with his character, who God is. God is a healer. The Bible calls him Jehovah Rapha. Now, you know the word, the name Jehovah or Lord. Uh, it comes from that word that the Jews use. They won't speak the name Jehovah or Lord because it's too sacred. So they only repeat the vows, yod heh vah -Heh. When they refer to him, they say yod heh vah -Heh. They won't call him by Jehovah because for them it's such a sacred, holy thing. But the Bible makes it clear that he is Jehovah Rapha. Now, throughout the Bible, there are different moments when a new name of God is introduced to us. As with Abraham and Isaac, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. The reason that was done is because in the Bible, name denotes character. It speaks of the very essence of the person. And so, Whenever you find a new name, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, and others, what you're doing is you're getting a new understanding of who your father is. And that's why it's important that you study the names of God. There are times when I need financial blessings and I will pray to Jehovah Jireh. Or if I need healing, I will pray to Jehovah Rapha because 
People like to hear their name. Psychologists say that whenever you approach someone and you call them by their name, it releases endorphins in their brain. We like to hear our name. It's very personal, it's very intimate. It's the very essence of who we are. And so whenever I approach my father, whatever need I have, I call him by that name because it's important to him. And I want him to understand that I know who you are and I know what you do. And I thank you for that. You're Jehovah Rapha. In Exodus chapter 15, we find the first time this name was given. The Bible says, this is after, this is after the exodus of Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea. They're just beginning their journey in the wilderness. It said, that's the place where God set up rules and procedures. That's where he started testing them. I want you to see that because this was a very important moment to God. He understood people. And he knew the people of Israel had just come through the 10 plagues. They'd seen a lot. There was a lot of death, a lot of destruction. And he was concerned about that. So this was a moment to test. God said to them, number one, if you listen and listen obediently to how God tells you to live in his presence, number two, obeying his commandments and keeping all his laws, then number three, that I won't strike you with all the diseases that I inflicted on the Egyptians. I'm not gonna do to you what I did to them. I don't want your past to create a fear for your future. He said, I'm not gonna do to you what I did to them because I am God, your healer, or I am Jehovah Rapha. You see, God was dealing with the bitterness that was in their heart here at the bitter waters of Myra, or Mara, excuse me. Now, the bitter moment of Mara revealed the bitterness in their hearts. You see, God was concerned. Would the Jewish people trust me? Now, I want you to think about this. Now, this is connected to his name, Jehovah Rapha. Now, listen to me. He was concerned, will the Jewish people trust me? Would the Jewish people remain faithful to, to, to him? And after Egypt, how would the Jewish people view him? Now listen, it mattered to God what Israel thought about him. This was important to God. He was concerned what the Israelites were gonna think about him. He wanted them to understand him and who he was. And he did not want them to view him as the God of Egypt with the 10 plagues and the death and the destruction. You remember when they got to Mount Sinai and all that began to happen there, you remember the Bible says they backed off of the mountain and said, whoa, and told Moses, you talk to him and then you tell us what he says. So this concern that God had was legit. These people were afraid of him. These people were fearful. Now, we're not talking about the fear of the Lord or respect. We're talking about being afraid of him. And they would not get up close and personal with him. They let Moses do it. But God was concerned here at these bitter waters, and he wanted them to drink that bitter water to deal with their bitterness and to deal with that that toxicity that was in them. Focusing on his character and not your circumstances will determine your understanding of the Father. I want you to know that focusing on on God's character and who he is, understanding him as Jehovah Rapha, and not focusing on your circumstances, it will help you to understand him. So often we get so caught up in our circumstances that we lose sight of who he really is. And we get overwhelmed by our circumstances. You remember Not long after this, Israel began to complain, what are we going to drink? What are we going to eat? You see, God's concern about the Jewish people trusting him was legitimate. He was concerned, will these people trust me? Will these people be faithful to me? How will these people view me? We hear in the news all the time about destruction and and things that are happening around the world. And we say, people will ask the question, well, why did God do that? Why did God kill those people? People don't have a good healthy view of who he is. They don't understand him. That's why it's so important that we're careful. We have to be careful on how we we represent him to the community. Don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That has to do with more than just you cussing. It has to do with misrepresenting his name or his character. 
Don't misrepresent him to people. Be very careful. When people say things to me, well, why did God do, do that? I said, well, God didn't do that. That's not my father. I understand everything is father filtered and I understand that God allows things. But I also know my father and what he does and what he doesn't do. And so when the world asks that question, I don't understand your loving God because he kills people. I go, no, stop. That's not my father. And we have to be very careful how we represent him to the community. That's why the fruit of the spirit and that's why our character and our integrity, our, our uh, reputation out in the community is so important because we're epistles read and known of all men. How men see us is how they see Jesus. And so we have to make sure that we represent him well. But God was concerned about the Jewish people and how they were going to view him and if they were going to trust him. And, but that's why it's so important for you as you're dealing with your problems that you focus on his character and not your circumstances. Because if you get your eyes on your circumstances, you're gonna get in trouble. But if you focus on his character, on the very essence of who he is, it changes everything. You can trust him. You can be faithful to him. You can be loyal to him because you know him. That's why you need to understand the names of God, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. He said to Israel, what I did in Egypt, I'm not gonna do to you. This was a moment, okay? This was a moment where God was officially introducing himself to the nation of Israel. They'd come out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, they got into the wilderness, and they came to this, the, this bitter waters of Mara, and he paused and he said, hey guys, listen, can we have a family meeting? I, I just, I'd like to introduce myself to you. And this is who I am. What you saw in Egypt, that's not me. That's not me. I want you to know that I am Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that heals you. And what I did to them, I'm not gonna to do to you. So I just want you to trust me. I want you to be faithful and loyal to me. It's important to me that you understand me. It's important that I know you view me as a loving father. I want you to see me. You see, Jehovah wants you to understand him. He does. Your father wants you to understand him. Who is he? I am the Lord, yod -Heh Vahe in Hebrew, self-existent or eternal, the proper name of God. He says, I will heal you. It means to mend, to cure, the physician, make whole, healer. That's who he is. That's what he wants you to know. Living in his presence, walking in his word, and understanding who he is, Jehovah Rapha, can keep you healthful. To understand that he is the God that heals me. He is the God that makes me whole. This is in my father's heart. This is the very essence of who he is. This is his character. My father wants to heal me. My father wants to make me whole. He wants to be my physician. He wants to mend. He wants to cure. He wants to heal. Jeremiah 8, 22. There, is there no bomb? It's a question. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people. The word Gilead there in the Hebrew means a heel of testimony, a heel. Is there no balm in your testimony? That's why testimonies are so important. That's why it's so critical that we have people stand up and say, this is what God did for me. Because in that testimony, there is a balm. In that testimony, there is a healing. What, when people hear your your testimony, when, you, when your story turns into a testimony and you tell them what God did for you, it builds faith in them and they're able to say, well, if God did it for them, he'll do it for me. Because the Bible makes it clear, he's not a respecter of persons. So on the hill of testimony, there is a balm. There is a balm. There is a healing anointing in testimonies. And so this morning, the Father wants you to understand him. He wants you to know who he is. It's like with Israel, it's like he would like to introduce himself to you again and say, this is who I am. Can I introduce myself to you? Hi, I am Jehovah. I am yod heh vah -Heh. I am Jehovah. I'm Lord, Rapha, or your healer. It's in his heart to heal you. 
It's in his heart to make you whole. He's here. You see, the answer to God's rhetorical question is the fact is, wherever there's testimonies, wherever there is praise for him, his power will respond. He asked the questions, a rhetorical question, is there no bomb in your testimony? The answer to that is yes. So as we testify, as we praise him, as we glorify him, there is a releasing of that healing anointing. So you've got to know this, his power responds to your praise. That's why it's so important that you praise your way out of your circumstances, that you praise your way out, even when you don't understand it. Be careful with the words of your mouth. Job's wife said, why don't you curse God and die? He was very careful. Though God slay me, yet will I trust him. I will not bring a charge against him. You can praise your way out of your problem. And you have to know his power will respond to your praise. So the first key to the mystery of healing. Now this is simple, but it's not simplistic. The first key to the mystery of healing is by nature. Jehovah is a healing God. By nature, he's a healing God. And you have, to, you have to let that get settled deep inside of you that the very essence of who he is, the very, his very core being, by nature, his character, he's a healing God. And that's important because whenever we come into a service like this, I, with this number of people, I promise you, there's someone in here sick that needs a healing And when we come into this service, we have to settle this issue right here and right now that God does want to heal. That God does want to heal. And how do I know that? Because it's a part of his character. It's a part of the very essence of who he is. His name is Jehovah Rapha. I know he heals. I know he wants to heal. And I know he can heal. That's very important. Because the devil will get in your ear and he'll tell you, God doesn't want to heal you. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't heal today. God's not going to heal you. He's a liar. And you have to know that. By nature, he's a healing God. Number two, you have to understand what moves the hand of God. Mark chapter one, again, back to the leper. It said that Jesus was moved with compassion. He stretched out his hand and he touched him. And he said to him, I, I'm willing, I, be cleansed. The word compassion there, as you know, in the Greek means it comes from the root word depicting the act of, of eating the internal organs of a sacrifice. This form of compassion means to feel sympathy, pity, or mercy. It means to have the bowels to yearn. And I know that's kind of a crude definition, and I apologize, but it means to literally reach in to the very guts of a matter and pull that out and to make that a part of you to where you don't feel for someone, but you feel with someone. It really has to do with empathy and not sympathy. Empathy, to empathize, to feel with someone. And this is what Jesus was doing in this moment. He was moved. You know, we often pray, God, would you move today? Now, this is a kingdom principle that I learned back in 2000 when I had that that experience where I physically, in a prayer time, heard keys of heaven rattling. And out of that experience that I had, God gave me that message, the anointing of compassion. And through that, I began to experience the anointing of praying for people. And, and, And I'll talk more about that here in just a moment. But Jesus was coming down in this leper. Now, you gotta remember, during this time, if you had leprosy, You were an outcast. You had to be separate from the community. If you came into a crowd, they could, by law, literally they could stone you. And so this gentleman uh, was desperate. You have to understand leprosy and how it begins to cause the extremities of the body to begin to decay and fall off, your your nose, your ears, and it's highly contagious. And it's it's a curse of death. And, and these lepers would walk around, typically they would cover their face because of the, the decay and they would sometimes ring a bell when they would encounter people and say, leper, leper, because they didn't want to be stoned and people would avoid them. 
So that means that uh, he lost contact with his wife, his children, his family. He couldn't go to the temple and worship. He wasn't allowed to. He lost contact with society and the community, and he lived in a leper colony. And it was a slow death of rotting away. But he must have heard the message of Jesus, and, and he throws himself at his feet, and he says, if you're willing, I, I know you can. I, I know you have the power. If you just, are you willing? He was wanting to be healed, not only physically, but he wanted to be restored back to his family, back to the community, back to the temple. He wanted to be able to go with the crowd, as the psalmist said, to the house of the Lord. He wanted his life back. And so he throws himself at, at Jesus' feet, and the Bible makes it clear that Jesus was moved. Now, it didn't say by faith. It didn't, it didn't say by theology, by the man's debate. He was moved off center by compassion. He, in that moment, looked at this man and he felt everything that that man was feeling. The physical pain, the decaying, the rotting of the human body, the stench, all that was taking place, but also the separation from his family and the loneliness. He, in that moment, he felt everything that that man was feeling. He felt the desire to be restored back to his life. And the Bible says that's what moved him off of center. It moved him with compassion. So Isaiah 53 and verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The word grief here, and, and the Hebrew means disease, okay? So he, Jesus, on the cross, bore our grief or our diseases, but it also, it also said our sorrows, and the word sorrow there means pain. He carried our pain. He carried the pain of the disease itself. He carried the loneliness, the fear. He carried the uncertainty, the questions, the confusion, how often we get conflicted. He carried all of that. He carried everything. And that's very important that you know that because the Bible makes it very clear that he stands at the right hand of the Father and we have a mediator or an advocate that is there advocating for you and I to the Father. He stands there making intercession for you and for me. And he does that not from sympathy, feeling sorry for us, but from empathy, he feels with us. He's moved by compassion. Jesus felt the pain and the loneliness of leprosy for the first time in a long time. Now, I, I, I just, I'm trying to set a, a stage for you for the first time in a long time. For this leper, someone stepped towards him. Now, up until now, everyone had went around him. Up until now, when he would come and cry out leper, people would pick up a rock and say, back off. His wife, his children could not embrace him. Perhaps he would go at certain times and try to stand at a distance and watch his family. Can you imagine the heartbreak? Can you imagine how painful that is? Can you imagine being cut off from society and you're watching your body rot and decay and in your very eyes is falling, your ears falling off, your nose. It's horrible. It's a horrible way to die. But for the first time, he threw himself at his feet. He was crying for mercy. He was saying, look, I know by law, you're a holy man. I know by law, there's a crowd. I know by law, y'all can pick up rocks and throw rocks at me. But he threw himself at his feet. And I just believe he wanted to say, here I live or here I die, but I won't live like this anymore. He put everything on the line. He said, it's either I get up from here and walk away healed or I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna die right here, but I ain't living like this anymore. And he said, I know you have the power if, you would just, if you're just willing. And Jesus was on a mission, but he was moved off center by compassion. And for the first time in a long time, someone stepped towards that leper and touched him. How long had it been since he felt the human touch? Because if you touch a leper, you're unclean, very contagious. 
It's contagious physically and it's ceremonially, you're unclean. You can't go to the temple. You have to isolate yourself for a number of days to make sure that leprosy doesn't pop up on you. But Jesus did, he did the forbidden. He touched the unclean. He touched him for the first time in a long time. And I just tell you that story again because I just wanted you to recapture the heart of your father and how he is to have empathy, to be moved with compassion. The word compassion, as I mentioned, means to yearn, bowels, to grieve. That's what intercessors do. Oftentimes, when you get into a spirit of intercession, you intercede and you bow. And back around 2000, when I had this, this um, it, it's a, it was a physical, it's like a theophany. I didn't see God, but I had this physical experience in a sanctuary where I was praying for the anointing of healing and, and I heard keys rattling. And out of this experience came this message of compassion the anointing of compassion. And God began to deal with me about being moved with compassion. And out of that, in times when, when in a service, I can feel that yearning, that bowing over. And in that moment, I, I, I know God wants to heal somebody. There are certain things that can happen in a service where you know you can feel the anointing in your hand. You can feel the yearning, the yearning, the bowels of yearning. Uh, you can get a prophetic word, a word of knowledge, but there are different things that can happen. And, and, and I want you to see this, that Jesus began to bow over, bow over with yearning for this boy, this, young, this man that was broken. This is important. Song, the Song of Solomon chapter eight says, my, speaking of Jehovah, my passion is stronger than the chains of death and the grave. Do you understand that God's love for you is stronger than the disease you have? The enemy will come along and he'll say, I'm gonna kill you. But God comes along with his love and says, my love is stronger than death. My love is stronger than the grave. My love for you. First John three, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Understand this transitional point that in a service like this one, when I feel compassion, when I feel the love of God, when I sense his love, I know that in that moment, we can transition from death to life. Do you see that bridge between death and life, between disease and healing? That compassion, that compassion that moves you, suddenly you feel that thing and, and you're, you're at a point where you can transition into life if you'll just do it. If you'll just follow that love, love is the evidence that a transfer has taken place and is taking place. When the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God in our hearts, Romans 5, we can know he's getting ready to heal somebody. So the second key to the mystery of healing is by nature again, and you gotta hear this, by nature again, Jehovah is compassionate. By nature, he's a healer, and that's great. But I need to know also that by nature, he is moved with compassion. That's what moves him. I understand the role that faith plays. I get it. I understand the role that correct theology plays. I get it. But I also know what compassion does. And when I go into a hospital room to pray with somebody, I remember this and I try so hard to find that place of compassion, to find that place, to go deep inside of me and to find the love of God and, and let that love move me into the anointing. Oh, there's someone, is there someone that's connecting with this? I, uh, to, to, to be moved, to let love, the love of God, the compassion of God move you into that place of the transition into life, that anointing. Let it move you, move you. I remember, oh, I'm, I'm just popped up in my little brain. I remember I was, in, I was at Brownsville and I went to the hospital to visit someone and I forget what it was some contagious disease where you had to put on 
you know, like a hazmat suit. I mean, I, not that bad, but you understand, all the junk, gloves and booties and robe and mask. and I mean, it was ridiculous. And then you had to go into this inner chamber and then you come, you go into that, you know, the outer chamber, inner chamber. And, and I had all that mess and, and people didn't want to go in there. And I said, mm, no, I'm going in. I'm going in there because of compassion. And you just, you go in and you pray with people and you do what no one else is willing to do. You touch the unclean and you minister life to them and you believe for a miracle. And, you, and I asked the nurse, I said, do I have to wear all this? She said, well, that's your choice. But you go, what moves you to do that? The love of God. What moves you to have compassion on people? The love of God. What will move you to reach out and touch the drug addict and the alcoholic and the homeless and the prostitute and the, I mean, what does? The love of God. It can move you. I just want you to understand there's a strong anointing whenever you're moved by the love of God. Jehovah is compassionate. My third point. Listen, hang on one second. I may preach now. (laughs) Y'all may not make Memorial Day. My third key. And I, I hope all three are, are important, I, but I, I hope you get you this one here. Oh my goodness. I want you to understand his commitment to your healing. Isaiah 53, verse five. And by his stripes, we are healed. Now I've never seen this before. I'm just, I'm being honest with you. I, I got into this yesterday morning and I began to dig and I found something that I just never saw before. By his stripes, we are healed. Now, I want you to understand that I, understand, I know that there's a little bit of a play on words here, and I get that, but I still, think, I, th- I still think it's applicable. I think there's, a, th- there's an application here. I, the word stripes in the Hebrew, it means bound with stripes, it speaks about the stripes being on the body. It's bound to the body. In essence, it's speaking about the scars on his back. He was bound with stripes. But the Bible says that it's by that those stripes were healed. Is it possible to also say that by the stripes and his body, Jesus is bound to our healing? Is it possible? The, the, it means bound by stripes, bound to it, obligated now. There's a connection there because by his stripes, we are healed. Does the father now ignore those stripes? Does the father just not see them any longer? Or do those stripes remind the father of that covenant, that atonement of divine healing? Think about it. Again, Mark 1, Jesus was moved with compassion and he said, I am willing. I am willing. The word willing there in the Greek, it means a determination to have in mind a desire, love, to take delight in. So you see, when Jesus said to that leper, I'm willing, what he was saying was, I've decided, I've determined that I'm gonna heal And I have a desire and I am moved with love and I take delight in doing this. That's a game changer for me because my father takes delight in healing people. My father is moved by love and he is determined. So what God has in mind for this moment is to heal the sick for he delights in our health. Let me help you understand this He is bound to those stripes. Not only did the stripes were bound to Jesus' body, but the Father is bound to the commitment of those stripes. He's bound by them because by his stripes, by that commitment, we are healed. But I want you to understand who your Father is. I want you to understand that 
by nature, he's a healer. I want you to understand that by nature, he's compassionate. But I also want you to understand that by nature, he is committed. Did you know that your body has the ability to heal itself? Just a few ways that your body heals itself. The liver can regenerate itself. Intestines can regenerate its lining. Bones grow back. Lungs can recover. The brain can build new connections. Cells can heal and then replace dead cells. And that list just goes on and on. In fact, doctors will talk about your immune system. Some people's immune system is stronger than others. That's why they tell you that the key to living in this day and age is to stay healthy. Justin and I have talked about this. He's a nurse practitioner, has his own clinic, and, and I've talked to him about like with COVID. COVID now is a part of our community, just like the flu is, okay? And the way we live in this world now is, of course, we walk in God's word, we walk in faith, we walk in, in the love of Jehovah Rapha, and we give our body a chance to fight off these diseases by staying healthy. Rather, it's going to the gym, eating, eating as best you can, but keeping your immune system up so your body can fight off disease, so your body can heal itself. Now, I, I mentioned all of these physical attributes because I want you to understand that your creator God, whose name is Elohim, created you that way. God intends for your body to heal itself. God intended for your body to stay healthy. That's important for you to know because again, it goes back to his very nature. He's a healing God. My God intended for man and the garden to live in health. But because of iniquity, it got in the blood. Now we've got cancer and diabetes and all kinds of hereditary problems, things that are passed down from generation to generation. But that wasn't God's doing. That was man's decision. Iniquity got in the blood. And now we have to deal with things that are hereditary, things, diseases. But Elohim, from the beginning, intended that we walk in health. Psalms 139, I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. God created us to walk in health. And I want you to see that, that Elohim always intended for you to be in health. Always. But I get it. We're living in a cursed environment now. Iniquity is in the blood. And so we have to contend with that which is hereditary. It's passed down from generation to generation. But when it pops up, I can go to Elohim, my creator God, and I can say to him, you have the blueprints to my body. I can go to Jehovah Rapha and say, I'm asking you now to heal me. I want to walk in divine health and divine healing. And, and I, I, I want to help, I want my body I want to give my body a fighting chance. So I'm going to stay as healthy as I can because in my design, God intended that I be healthy. Listen to this from the Mayo Clinic, not from a preacher. Whether you get a cut or a broken bone, the body has a phenomenal ability to heal itself. When that process fails, the body doesn't know how to restart itself and it manifests itself in disease. What we've worked on in this, this project they're on uh, is, are ways to restart the body's healing process. Even doctors at Mayo Clinic recognize the fact that the human body has, the, has a way of healing itself. And they're trying to get down to the cellular level and learn how to work with that to, to help to assist the body to heal itself. But you and I know where all this comes from. It comes from Elohim. In the beginning, he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. You have access to the tree of life. You can eat of that tree. You can walk in health. You can live forever. God intended for man to live forever. But because of rebellion and then iniquity gets in the blood, man began to die. And we went from what? Adam lived to be what? Over 900 years to now the average life is 75 and so it's that decaying is taking place. But I said all of that to say this, your father is a healing God who is compassionate and is committed to your healing. He is committed to your health because it's who he is. So the takeaway, by nature, he's healing. By nature, he's compassionate. 
by nature. He is bound. He is bound. He is bound to our healing. And I know this because of what happened in John chapter 20 with doubting Thomas. Upper room, doors are closed, windows are closed, fear, afraid, what they did to Jesus, they're gonna do to us, the disciples. And suddenly Jesus walks into the room and he looks at Thomas and he says, son, look at, look at my scars. Look at my hands. Look at my side, son. This is who I am. This is me. So I know that after the resurrection, he still has those scars. And we know that scars are the credentials of the overcomer. Okay? So Jesus at the right hand of the Father stands there. And you come up to this altar and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm sick. I just want to believe Jesus stands up and turns to the Father with his credentials. He turns to the Father and shows him his back and says, I'm bound to these scars and you're bound to these scars also because you said by his stripes, I will heal you. You said, your name is Jehovah Rapha. You said, you're bound to these scars just like I am. And I'm interceding for that dear saint and I'm asking you, Father, to heal them. Jesus makes intercession because Isaiah 53 said, surely, he has borne our griefs and our sorrows. The word surely there means to be firm or determined, strong, assertive force. That's my Jesus. Surely he is determined. So just remember this, that God has decided. He's determined. Huh. And when it comes to you, John three sixteen. For God so loved, when it comes to you, he just can't help himself. The mystery of healing.